Pleased to be joined out here at Blog of the Boys by the one, the only, the incredible, internationally famous debonair. Uh, he's got the finest taste in the world, I'm sure. Um, we'll have to break bread one day to ultimately figure it out. The one and only former general manager of the New York Jets, Mike Tannenbaum. Mike, thank you so much for taking the time to join us. RJ, great to be with you this afternoon. How's your palate, honestly? Are you a foodie or are you, you know, whatever? Yeah, I, I, you? I, 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 I can hang. You know, I, I wouldn't say like I'm a first rounder. I'd probably say like more of a value, like mid second rounder that, you know, knows enough to be dangerous. Sure. What'd you have for lunch today or breakfast today? Like what's, what's the last meal you ate that you're proud of? I would say, uh, you know, and maybe our former dietitian, I actually used to call it the Mary Ellen, Mary Ellen Kelly, who did a great job. So it was uh, all vegetables with uh, egg whites and wow. uh, it's a winning meal. Okay. It's, uh, and- I was going to say a little dab of spicy mayo, just just oh, a little dab of spicy mayo for flavor. Right. Just to keep you awake and alert. Um, I was going to, you know, get to the football, but I have to ask, especially with the players going on while we're talking, what is the golf course behind you? So that is uh Bandon dunes, which oh. is on the Pacific Northwest. Well done. And, and if you look carefully, RJ, you can see a lot of my balls in the fescue <laughs> hundreds of them. My, uh, my game didn't match it, but it's a, uh, it's a very special place. Have you been? I have not, but I obviously have heard a lot of great things. It's a great, you know, bachelor weekend type place. All the courses, uh, the new, sh- the new one, Sheep Ranch is highly renowned. Um, so they're all really great. And I, that's something that my dad and I, you know, that's our thing. And so um, we're planning a trip there as soon as the world gets back to normal. Well, that's great. And where are you based out of RJ? I live in South Texas, uh, in the Rio Grande Valley, a little bit south of San Antonio, uh, literally the border of Texas. Uh, if you've ever heard of like McAllen, Texas um, gets uh, deep south. So uh, the state of Texas can be rather large. And so people are obviously uh, shocked sometimes uh, when you tell them how big it is. Yeah, no, that's great. And uh, I can see where you're Rachel, you're a big cowboy fan, huh? Yeah, well, so I cover the Cowboys uh, for SB Nation, and so it's been a busy week, needless to say, and uh, it's been a productive week, I would say. Um, I'll, I'll start there, obviously, because there is no place better, and, and you're the expert, and that's why we're curious to pick your brain on some things. Dak's contract has been referred to as uh, arguably the best that any player has ever landed with an NFL team. Do you share that sentiment? I think there's a lot of great things about his contract, and Look, it's somewhat subjective in terms of you, you could look at Patrick Mahomes' deal and his rolling guarantees, and there's parts of his contract that are outstanding, RJ. What I would say is when you look at 31 and change for 2000, excuse me, for 2020, and then four years at 160, so it's 191 over five, that comes in a little under 39 million for where Deshaun Watson did. So for those Cowboy fans that want to know what's good for them is, they really got five years of cost certainty for a little bit under the shot, but make no mistake about it, this is a great deal, you know, for Dak Prescott and his family. I'm curious, uh, as somebody who's negotiated a lot of deals, obviously, um, the the question that people kind of keep getting to is what took so long then? Because this is kind of, and I'm sure you are aware, nationally viewed as something that Dak won, getting the $40 million annually starting at this point, the highly guaranteed value, the no tag clause, the no trade clause. All these things are kind of the bells and whistles that people look at on the, on the superficial level. Um, so if that was the case, if the Cowboys were going to quote unquote cave, why wait? I mean, I mean, put yourself in those shoes, I guess. Would you have done this last year, maybe? Yeah, and look, you know, we're not inside the room, but, you know, looking at things, what you would say, like, what's evident to me is they probably did try to get a deal done, and Dak, a little bit like Kirk Cousins, really bet on himself. You know, what's interesting and what's different than, um, like, I, I don't think Dallas handled things great with Zeke Elliott right? in terms of he had a couple of years to go, but what's different is, as a fourth-round pick, he signed a four-year deal. And I'm sure Dallas did try to sign him, but what's interesting is if you do well enough off the field and just watching Dak, it looked like he had, you know, let's say meaningful income from off the field endeavors. He really played it correctly from a standpoint, like he just bet on himself and he went one year at a time. And I think one of the most things, one of the most interesting things about the situation is he had the big injury. It actually helped him basically because I think Dalton was average. And I think people saw like, Dallas is a pretty average team without Dak Prescott. So I think it was a confluence of a few things that basically he bet on himself. He wanted to play out the tag and by him getting hurt, it actually helped. And I think the other interesting thing is by the cap going down, I think it forced a sense of urgency that that tag at 37 million this year, RJ just would have been untenable for Dallas. 
Right. No, I think that's that's a really interesting point. The kind of uncontrollable factors, the Dalton factor, the obviously impact of COVID on the salary cap really worked against the Cowboys in that capacity. Um, I, I think, you know, another take that people see a lot here is um, is the 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 I guess the lure of the Cowboys brand. I'm curious, is that something that you ever tried to leverage in New York? Hey, you're you're here. Welcome to the market. This isn't this isn't Kansas City. This isn't Jacksonville. You know, you've got you've got more eyes on you. You've got more opportunities. Is is that a real thing, or is that something that that people just kind of say to one another when when they're talking to their friends or the family or whatever? Yeah, when, when you're with a team, you're trying to leverage any morsel you have. So when <laughs> it was New York, it was, hey, this is the biggest, the best, the brightest. It's the number one sport in the world, the number one city in the world. In South Florida, it was about you know. I used to tell uh, our staff like, look, every sentence should begin and end with. Did we mention we didn't have any state income tax? Right. I mean, we have a huge competitive advantage. So um, wherever you are, look, to be the quarterback of the Dallas Cowboys is, is really special. And I think Dak really carries that mantle incredibly well. Like, he's smart. Like, you talk to people inside the building, like, he has authentic relation, uh, leadership. And, and what I mean by that is it's not like posting something on social media sure. just to, to get attention. Like, in a meaningful way, he impacts others. And that's what leadership is about. So if I think that sometimes people miss this, which is we could sit here, RJ, and say, you know what? He really should have been 34 million a year or maybe 35, but you know, 40, we don't feel great about. And you can talk yourself into anything, but if for that extra $5 million a year, he makes people around him better, it's well worth it because over the course of whatever it is, four or five years, they're going to spend 800, $900 million on players so if you're going to overpay by $20 million on a percentage basis, it's pretty small. And again, I think this speaks a lot about the character of Dak. I think that's well said. I um, I have some more questions about his contract specifically, but um, I haven't really had somebody that I could ask this particular question to, um, and you really fit that mold. D- Dak's rookie year, Mark Sanchez was his backup quarterback besides Tony Romo, of course. And he spoke a lot that season about how impactful Mark was from a mentor, a big brother standpoint, whatever you want to call it. And something I remember him saying was that Mark told him, look, you – you don't understand what you're doing. You know, you you don't get how difficult this is. And obviously, you know, high level of success that Mark had, and you will know with the Jets. And so is, is that something too, to kind of not being a deer in the headlights, but but maybe being naive upon entering the NFL, um, where, where it is valuable to have somebody like a Mark Sanchez who has been there, who has done that, who has learned lessons after that and matured, whatever you want to call it. I mean, I, I think that people underscore how important something like that has been to Dak Prescott's development. Yeah, and RJ, I would take it a step further. Um, like, look at the young coaches that have benefited from having head coaches around them, you know, Sean McVay had Wade Phillips. I mean, I can give you a hundred examples. Right. Kevin Spansky has Bill Callahan. And I can speak firsthand. I was the assistant general manager in the jet building for five years. When I became the, uh, the general manager, Terry Bradway, who I succeeded and became more of a, just a player personnel um, executive. I called him like 10 times a day. Like it took me about 18 months for the day to slow down, to really understand the job. It's, unless you're in the seat of a GM or a head coach or a quarterback, it's really hard to explain it. And, and Mark's a very selfless, thoughtful guy. So to hear that, uh, I'm really not surprised. Yeah, it is. Um, they had a very special relationship so much. I remember that off season, just kind of championing the book. I mean, bring him back, right? Like if, if he, if he makes stack even one iota better, like that's the most important thing uh, when it comes to the Cowboys. And so uh, Mike, I'm curious because well, th- this is a really, I think, confusing thing. And as you know, um, contracts, you know, when they're reported are slanted one way, guaranteed money, total guaranteed, guaranteed for injury, all sorts of different qualifiers, but people have heard the term void years when it comes to Dax deal. Can you kind of explain how that works or what that means um, with, with this? Cause I think people get caught up. It's a four-year deal. It's a six-year deal and the benefit that this provides to the Cowboys specifically. So basically if you just took a signing bonus um, and you could either prorate it over four years or in this case, six years. So let's just use round numbers. So let's just say that he signed for $6. If he had signed a four year deal, basically you were going to be prorating six over four, which would be a dollar 50 a year. Well, you could take that same $6 and initially you could prorate it over six years. So now it's like costing a dollar, which is fantastic because now you're saving 50 cents that you can now spend on other players. At some point, 
the fifth and sixth year will go away. They will void. They won't count in terms of like the length of Dak's uh, contract. And then therefore, when that happens, the money that was paid to Dak Prescott but had not hit the cap will accelerate from the sixth year to the fourth year. So in that example, the other two dollars, a dollar for year five and a dollar for year six would accelerate into year four. But for the first couple of years, you're saving, you know, in this case, substantial amounts of money, which I'm sure they're going to use to try to sign other players. Now, the one negative to it is, RJ, if we're having this conversation in three years, when that day comes when that money's accelerated in, there's going to be a higher cap charge. But I'm sure what Jerry and Stephen Jones are saying is, yeah, but you know what? Then the caps are going to be 230, 240 million dollars. Yeah, I think that that's a way of protecting themselves and a way of, you know, just kind of making everything sing and soar in the proper way. I think that Zach Ertz has a similar mechanism in his current contract, if I'm correct. And I think he's in the final year before the two voided years. You mentioned it, Mike, um, I, and I, I know you know, and I know you know from your you know work now that you do, and I want to get to that as well. There is this misconception online on the internet that uh, once you pay a quarterback, you can't do anything else. What, what do you think of that philosophy? Do, do you, cause I think a lot of people think that that's just um, e- either archaic or um, something that people say in the media to, to kind of negotiate through the media, get fans against the quarterback or against the player, or whatever, be on the team side. The Joneses love to talk about the, the pie and the pieces that are a lot of the different players. I mean, are the Cowboys weighed down towards building a team because of Dak Prescott's contract, I guess. I think it's harder, but it's not impossible. You know, we saw today, Eric Fisher, Mitchell Schwartz get cut by Kansas City. Look, you know, Patrick Mahomes is going to get more expensive. But, you know, at its most basic level, would you rather have Patrick Mahomes and a higher cap number and two new tackles, or would you rather have Mitchell Schwartz and Eric Fisher and no Patrick Mahomes, right? So um, you would rather have the quarterback and a higher cap number. Um, You just have to make choices. I think the one player that Dallas lost, I I think they'd like to have is Byron Jones, who signed with Miami. And, um, I think that goes a little bit back to the Zeke Elliott decision. It just, right. it does force you to make choices. But again, I think they're great problems to have. I agree with you. And I think um, the 2019 off season kind of lead up to the season during training camp and Zeke with the Cabo kind of presented this opportunity for them to, you know, buck the other way in that trend. And I, I know you hear the, the chatter. And again, you're super online, you're super hip, that running backs don't matter. But it does kind of feel like that philosophy has really taken weight over the last three, four years, almost maybe, you know, you could look at the, the drafting of Zeke as kind of the break point of that. Do you, like, I'm, I'm sure that that was never like a, a hardcore philosophy that, that, you know, was, was running through NFL buildings uh, when you were a general manager, but does, does that feel like an evolution of thought that now we realize that it is not the, mo- the most fiscally responsible way to develop money? Well, I would say, you know, it's interesting because like today was Travis at the end per day at right. Clemson and, um, I think sometimes we paint a pretty broad brush. One of the commentators compared uh, Etienne to Marshall Fall, and <laughs> sort of like that weapon. So there is a place for, for running backs and, and great ones. There always will be. I think more, more and more of them, like if we didn't know anything, we just flew in and we watched the Cowboys play, and you just watched you know, the whole season of Zeke Elliott compared to Tony Pollard, I think it's closer. You know, Certainly, I think Elliott's the better player. Right. But is he contextually worth, you know, 8 million more, 10 million more, 12 million more? That's why I think we could put in a $10.8 million dead money charge for Zeke next year. Um, as Dax deal, you know, ramps up, Zeke's going to have to graduate and they'll be fine. Um, Cause I don't think he's going to be dynamic enough to make plays in the past game to say that he's not a replaceable part. So I think skill sets are really important. You know, Kenyon Drake, someone we drafted in Miami, He's an explosive playmaker. I think there's places for him in the NFL. I think when you get for, like, it was interesting, like, to your point, RJ, like, Aaron Jones wasn't franchised at $8 million. Like, that was a number I thought, hmm, you know, Green Bay may tag him. So there is a place, but there is a limit on, on their value. You're right. I mean, it, it by no means is easy to replace anybody in the NFL. I think that the general consensus is that running back is the the smallest challenge, so to speak, just because it is a position and the production is somewhat dependent on other factors that are more important, higher priority, whatever you want to call it. I'm with you. I thought it was 
maybe not a mistake, but I thought it would have been in a weird way of value for the Packers to franchise tag Aaron Jones, just also in the sense that it's a one-year commitment. Like that, that's an aspect of the tag that I think people kind of overlook. It's just fine. We'll just do it this year. And then next year, go do whatever, especially in the position the Packers are in where I, I also, I kind of hate the term win now. I don't know if, if you feel that way. Cause I, I mean, I don't, I know that tanking is, is a super, you know, different thing in and of itself, but I feel like people apply win now, like, like somebody wants to win more than somebody else. You know what I mean? Yeah, that, that's, I think, look, I learned firsthand in my career, like, there's no such thing as tanking, because I got hired in 1997 by the New York Jets. In 96, the New York Jets won one game. In 97, we won nine. In 98, we were in the AFC Championship game. Right. We had two guys, Bill Parcells and Bill Belichick. That's why we were successful. And it, if you hire the right people, these things can be turned around very quickly. So, Mike, I want to hear about the 33rd team. Um, you know, I love the title at the homepage of the website, the Premier Football Think Tank, uh, mostly because it kind of for a second reminded me of the English Premier League. Um, but, um, but tell me about the 33rd team. Yeah, RJ, really appreciate you asking me. So it's really a confluence of two things. Great coaches that are between opportunities. In fact, as a Dallas fan, Dan Quinn, who is a good friend of mine, um, spent about six months with us. And it's a place just to go. We... Uh, just kick around the ideas, thoughts, how to make teams better, cap better, clock management. We watch film together, and we have tons of coaches from um, the Dan Quinns of the world, Wade Phillips, Greg Schiano. We have about a half a dozen general managers that have run teams, and then we have, like, world-class grad students. And together, we just, you know, look at the game. Like I said, watch tape together. And we have, RJ, a free newsletter. It's 100% free if you go to our website the 33rd team.com you can subscribe to it it comes right to your inbox and it's a quick read and it's just some thoughts on what's going on in the nfl yeah i heard you on the around the nfl podcast i think you said that dan quinn hopped on um to talk to some grad students or something like that and kind of break down some film in that sense um my my last one um is more of i guess a philosophical decision because this it, it feels like every week the Cowboys have something that like is the the most bickered thing going on in the world of football. Uh, but in a game that involved Mike McCarthy and Dan Quinn this past season, and Mike McCarthy has taken, you know, he had the the McCarthy project last year that was, you know, similar, I think, in this to wanting to build a network of coaches, which is really, I think, a, a good thing uh, for coaches who want to figure out how to, you know, how to improve, how to get better, et cetera. But the game between the Cowboys and the Falcons, when Mike McCarthy chose to go for two, that was debated all over the world. What did you think about that? Did you think it was in correct or did you like the decision to go for it early I, I like it you know I thought it was aggressive but I like it um you know the certainly the information RJ over time you know shows like if you go for two earlier in the game it gives you more opportunities to course correct so I know other people feel differently but when your head coach is the play caller right and he wants to go for two you stats are part of the discussion but you know in his mind he has a play that he's convicted about Right. And I agree with that. Uh, the 33rd team.com that's 33rd with two threes, not don't spell it out. That's a lot to spell. Uh, you guys make it nice and simple. Mike, we got to hit sheep ranch or Bandon dunes or somewhere. We'll go to whistling straights and we'll just be part of the Ryder cup team. I think is what we'll do this, uh, this coming fall. Okay. Let's go. I'm ready. Appreciate it, Mike. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. All right. Thanks a lot for having me. Appreciate it.